Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. We are heirs. Can I hear you say it? We are heirs. Uh -huh, that's it. We are heirs. Heirs of God. Who is a heir? Someone who is entitled to the inheritance of his father or mother, right? So if your father have a building, that means it's your building. It will be passed on to you. If your father had properties and landed properties or maybe money somewhere, they say he's a heir. Or if your father is a king or a chief, they say that he's a heir apparent to the throne. That means when the father departs this world, he takes over. You understand? He will not be crown king or crown the queen or whatever it is. So you see, we are heirs of God, meaning that everything the Father has is ours. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and all that dwell therein. So if everything in heaven and on earth belongs to him, it's ours. If the earth is the Lord's and everything inside the earth is ours. If the world belongs to him and everything in the world is ours. He said the cattle of a thousand hills are mine. Huh? So all the cattle belong to us. So the wealth of my father is mine. So I shouldn't be poor. Now my prayer is that this understanding that we're gaining from this study will change you completely and will break all barriers so that you are not only meet God ever again in your life. I know sometimes we look at God things and we wonder how will God do it. Leave him to how he will do it. Your own concern is, can he do it? Will he do it? Is it my right? Is it my portion? Is it part of my inheritance? If it's part of your inheritance, you will get it. You will possess your possessions. Sometimes we fight, we fight to possess what God has given us. But first of all, you must agree, it is mine. It is mine. Caleb said, give me this land. God promised us, give me. 80 years now, but I can take it. And it happened. So, heirs of God. And we're not just heirs of God, we are joint heirs with Him. Joint heirs means we are co inheritors with Christ. So, that means whatever Jesus has access to, we have access to it too. Whatever claims Jesus have in Christ, we have it. I mean, in God, we have it too. So what is available to Jesus is available to you and I. Do you understand that? So heaven is your home. Now, picture it this way. It means if the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, I can prosper anywhere. I don't need to be in the city of Lagos where it is happening. I don't need to be in Abuja, the federal capital, before it happens. I don't need to be in the corridors of power before I can prosper. I can prosper anywhere. He said, blessed shall you be in the city. Blessed shall you be in the country. The country means the village side. So when I'm in the village or I'm in the city, I will prosper. For the Lord owns everything. That means the same anointing works everywhere. The same grace works everywhere. Is someone hearing what I am saying? Uh -huh. The same God is everywhere and he owns everywhere so he can bless my work. With God, don't limit him. If you want him, don't limit him. Don't put God in a box. Understand you can make it. Your beginning may be humble, the scripture say, but so prosperous will your future be. Right now, things may be tough. Things may be difficult. You may look at your light, right, your left, and look behind, look in front of you. You don't see any way using your brain calculating. You don't see anybody to help no one to, you know, lend a helping hand. But that does not mean you're going to remain on that spot. Things will get better. God will make a way. Miracles will happen. 
God can do all things. And you are the hair of God. Can you imagine it? If you are the king of a place, let's say your village, your hometown where you come from, you are the king. You are the Oba or the Bale, as they used to say in Lagos. Now imagine that, and your son is supposed to take over. Will you give your son the best education? Will you protect your son if enemies are trying to take him away from you? Hmm? You will give him maximum protection because he's the one who's going to carry on your name and your legacy. He's the one who's going to sustain the truth. You will give him the best education. You will make sure he has enough bodyguard to protect him that no harm befalls him. You will be after his interests. Now, if you can do that as a man, what about God? If you are the head of God, like the Bible says, from which we believe, and I'm sharing with you that you are, God will give you maximum protection. God will watch over you. God will take care of you. God will help you become exactly what he wants you to be because he's counting on you to continue his life. Why was Saul, King Saul, fighting David? Because he saw David as a threat. David is going to hijack the throne from his lineage. That means his own son will not sit on that throne. None of his descendants will sit on that throne. Because if he moves from his family and moves to David, that means it has shifted from him to another family. And he doesn't want that. So he was looking for him to kill him by all means. That is a human being. What about God? God will not leave you defenseless. So be rest assured you are well defended. Eh? God is on your side. I say God is on your side. Heaven is on your side. The angels of God are also on your side. So you cannot afford to fail. Everything God created will be on your side also. I command them to be on your side. And no man can invoke them to be against you because you are God's own. Praise God. So if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory, you cannot enjoy the blessings of of God without going through some form of suffering or the other in the name of Christ. So this passage is telling us we are heirs of God, we are joint heirs with Jesus, but we will have to go through the sufferings with him also. So they will persecute you. They will come against you because of your stand and your faith in Christ. Don't let that stop you. Don't let that discourage you. I hope you're hearing what I'm saying. Stand your ground. Stand your ground. No matter the persecution, no matter the opposition, no matter the trials, the enemy may you know, put up to try to discourage you and make you go backward. Don't yield to him. Don't bow to him. Stand your ground. In other words, the glory comes al alongside with sufferings. How many of you have seen the, the rose flower? I'm not talking of the plastic one. Have you ever seen the rose flower, the real one? Huh? If you have seen it, if you look at it, you will discover that there are thorns. Huh? The, the, you know, the, where the flower comes from, if you are not very careful, the thorn will sting you and then a little bit of it will cut into your skin and you'll be uncomfortable. So you see, anything that is beautiful comes with a little bit of uh, trouble. So because you believe in Jesus, the enemy, the enemy of God is now your, automatically your enemy. Even though you may be running from enemies, but don't forget, the devil is an enemy of God. And so, as long as you are now on the side of God, he is your enemy forever. And he's going to continue to try his best to prostrate you and discourage you from following Christ. So that will make you uncomfortable. And there are those who will not like the fact that you always tell them what the truth is. They feel you are trying to prove you are holier than them. 
Because you can't stand wickedness, you can't stand uncleanness, you can't stand unrighteousness. So you will keep telling them, this is not right, this is not good, this is the way God wants us to behave. This is the way God wants us to behave. And they may not like that. They will persecute you for it. When they are talking, and the moment you come, all of them will keep quiet. And it feels very, you know, somehow, that as long as they are miss, nobody talks anymore. So are you now a problem to them? You'll be thinking. They want to isolate you. They want to make you feel miserable. And then when you are going, they are making these, you know, remarks about you. And some of these things will filter into your ears and you become very uncomfortable. You don't have to mind them. It is part of the cost of following Christ. If you want the glory, you will have to endure. Somebody asks, uh, what's this great man's name? Very popular preacher in Nigeria. Okay, let's let me leave that so that we just finish up. Somebody was asking him, How can I get your account of anointing? He said, It's not just to say, Lord, I covet. He asked them, Can you go through what I have gone through? Uh, thank you. You still remember it. Can you go through what I have gone through? One day, he lost all his. One day. He parked the vehicle, crossed the river, a uh, small river or something to go and uh, attend to some things. By the time, he, before he could come back, the children, I don't know whether by mistake, I don't know what happened. You know, they engaged the, the movie from here and the motor rolled into the river. So he just came, jumped inside. I think the wife was pregnant or something. Jumped inside the water and he was bringing them out as he was you know, brought them out and laid them on the ground. They're trying to see what to do. A trailer just came again. And, uh, so you see, there is suffering. I'm not saying you must go through that to have the kind of anointing. But what I'm trying to say is that when you see people enjoying this kind of authority and power, you want to experience it. But when they tell you what they have gone through, the challenges, the troubles that is accompanying their lives, you will marvel. So please don't be discouraged when you seem to be going through some tough time. Amen? I hope you're hearing me. So because we have been made children of God, we have automatically become heirs of God. That's just it. Not only that we have become heirs of God, but join heirs with Jesus Christ. We are sharing Jesus Christ's inheritance with him. But all, all of us need to understand that though it is yours, you've got to possess it. You've got to take a stand and make sure it becomes yours. As you are hearing that it is yours through prayer, through positive conviction, through the desire to see it manifest, let's enter into it and enjoy it. Jesus is no longer the only one inheriting all that the kingdom of God has to offer. But all his brothers and sisters, as believers, are sharing with him. So we are partakers of this inheritance because we are sons and daughters of uh, God. Now, can we quickly read Galatians chapter 3, verse 29? If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to promise. So heirs according to promise. Galatians chapter 4, verse 7. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. You are no longer what? A slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. So every son is a heir to what the father has. You are not a slave, you are not a servant, even though we call ourselves servants of God. Actually, what we should be calling ourselves is sons of God all the time. Honestly. Because a son is greater than a servant. A son occupies a closer position than servant of God. Oh, let us welcome the man of God, you know, the servant of the Lord. You know, that's what we always say, servant of God, servant of God. Yes, we are serving God, but I would have preferred son of God. Yeah? You know, when I want to call him and say, let's welcome the son of God. He would say, huh? So what will come to your mind is, I thought that is Jesus' title. But that's our title. Every one of us who believe in Jesus. If he's your father, then you are his son. 
When Jesus said, my God, it's called God his father. They took up stones to stone him. Why? So he makes himself equal with God. Because if he's your father, that means the same life he has is what you have. You are sharing his nature with him. That's why they say, no, this is too much. You must be out of your mind. So you are no longer a slave. What are you? A son, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. Ephesians 3 verse 6. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel. The Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. So, the Jews were the ones who had covenant with Almighty God through Abraham. But now, through Jesus Christ, both the Gentiles now have covenant with God. So, we are now co-heirs, joint heirs. We are sharing the inheritance with the Jews. The Jews in Christ and believe, uh, in Christ. So they believe in Jesus, we believe in Jesus. So it's not only them who have access to God, we too now have access through Jesus Christ, just as they have through Jesus Christ. So that's just it. So whatever it is that God has for his children, all of us will share. So whether you are born a slave or you are come from a descendant, you are come from your ancestors are slaves. So that means by extension, you too, you are a slave. Now that you have become a son of God, in the eyes of God, you are no longer a slave. If you were a Gentile, a non-Jew, now that you have believed in Jesus Christ, in the eyes of God, you are just like any other Jew who believed in Jesus. You understand that? So in Christ Jesus, there is no Greek. There is no Jew, there is no Igbo, there is no Aosa. All of us are sons of God, citizens of heaven. I hope you are getting my point. There is no slave, there is no free, uh, free person, there is no male, there is no female, no gender. It's not important whether you are a man or woman. All of us are given power to become sons of God. So your color doesn't matter. White man, blue man, green man, yellow man, it doesn't matter. Do you understand? Whether you are slim or you are fat, whether you are educated or not, whether you are poor or rich, it doesn't matter. Titus chapter 3 verse 7. So that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. We have been justified by his grace. We might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. So we are justified by the grace. So we are sons of God. And so we have become heirs of eternal life. So eternal life is ours. What is eternal life? The very life of God. First Peter 3, 7. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as a weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. So see your wife, just the same way you have access to God, that's how your wife has access to God, it says. So when you recognize that, you, the way you treat her will be different. You will treat her with love and so your prayers will not be hindered. Number two, the second thing that we inherited is we have access to the presence of God. Access. 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 You know what access is? You can enter his presence anytime. You can come in and go out when you feel like. Access. In your father's house, you can go into the bedroom. You can go and see him where he is seated. You can sit by the bedside with him and talk. But a visitor cannot. How many of you know that? So access means nothing hindering you. The door is always open for you. So part of this inheritance is that we have access into the presence of God 24 hours daily. To obtain grace and mercy in time of need, according to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. It is this understanding that the writer of Hebrews is bringing out here. He said, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence. No fear. Don't come shaking. Don't come with guilt. Don't come afraid whether he will hear you or answer you. 
Don't come like a slave. Don't come like a beggar. Come like a son. You know, there's a way your son or your daughter used to ask you things. There's a way your children used to ask you things. They don't ask like an outsider. How many of you understand what I'm talking about? Even you, when you used to ask your parents, you don't ask like an outsider. You come confidently. You come boldly. Say, but how do we go? Oh, God. Oh, Lord God. 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 But what Jesus, when he prays, my father, our father. There's a difference. When you call father, the relationship between you and the person is very close. You are not tensed up when you are coming. You are not coming like one who is scared. You are not coming like one who is begging. You are not coming like one who will be rejected, who will be refused. You are coming like one who is so loved and the connection is so strong. And the, the, the relationship you have with him is so real and so intimate. So you come with that mindset. Say, come, approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. In our time of need. So we have access 24 7. Any time of the day. So please, I want you to clear this from your head. There is no devil, no witch who can stop your prayer from traveling to God. I've heard people pray that prayer. Let us first of all bind all the demons who we want to stop our prayers in the heavens. Let's clear the air. First of all, clear the air first. <laughs> you think what does the first place if you have received it? Where is it? Yep. Inside you. When you received him, where did you receive him into? You receive him into your house or into your kitchen or where? Is it not into your heart? Hey, where is he now? He's there. He said, if you love me, we will we, we come our, and make our home where? In you. We make our home in you. So where is his home? Me. You. So why is it that when you are not praying, you are thinking of a prayer passing through the ceiling, then go through the roof, then travel in the air? Maybe one aircraft can jam it. Or one demon will put a tapolin somewhere and gather all the prayers and collect the prayers. And the people pray all kinds of funny prayers in some places. Those people that collect prayers. I don't understand what they mean by collecting prayers. And after they finish, they will pray and cover the prayer with the blood of Jesus. What kind of nonsense is that? It sounds like you are praying, but you are talking rubbish. You are ignorant. So if you pray, if you pray, if you've been praying like that, please don't pray that again. If you've been having that mindset, your prayers can be hindered. Please leave that. I know you quote for me. Somebody said, eh, "But Daniel's prayer was hindered." No, Daniel's prayer was never hindered. The Bible recorded it was the angel who was sent to explain some things to him based on the prayer he prayed that was engaged in warfare. It was not his prayer that was hindered. But when the angel arrived, he said, the very moment you prayed, God heard and God dispatched me. So was his prayer hindered? No. The moment he prayed, God heard and God dispatched him. He said, but the prince of Pesha will lead me on the way. So we've been fighting. We don't let me cross. So Michael, which is your chief priest, the Michael, the archangel, had to come and help me. In other words, take over the fight so that I can come to explain things to you. Because the patient prince, that's his principality in charge of Pesha, wants to take over quickly before the time allotted. So it has to be stopped because the time hasn't come yet. God works in the time to me. You wait for your time. I hope someone is hearing what I'm saying. All right, so please let's bear this in mind. Your prayers cannot be hindered. The Bible says when Jesus Christ gave up the ghost, when it said, uh, into, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit, there was an earthquake. And the Bible said the cutting of the temple that divided the Holy of Holies from the, you know, the outer court was torn in two. Meaning 
everybody who believes can now have access to the presence of God. It's no longer hidden. So the presence of God is not hidden from those who believe in him. Do you believe in him? Are you born again? You have access. So you can call upon God anytime, anywhere. It doesn't matter your position. If you like, put your head on the ground and raise your two legs. God will see answer you. You stand on your two feet and raise your head. God will answer you. You lie down. God will answer you. You sit down. God will answer you. Any position you take, God will answer. You need that. God will answer. He's everywhere. He said, pray without ceasing. So if we want anything, we can ask of the Father in the name of Jesus Christ and it will be given to us. John 16, 23. Anything you want. You have access. Ask. John 16, 23. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. I tell you the truth. My Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. So, if you don't ask, you won't receive. So, you ask. He said, we have access into the storehouse of God. God has so much stored away. We have access into the bounty of God. God's riches and possessions have become ours. We can freely draw from it to meet our needs in the name of Jesus. In Malachi 3.10, he gave us the secret that will enable us to receive these things. He said, bring your tithes and your offerings. And when you do that, he said, I will throw open the floodgates of heaven. King James says, I will open the windows of heaven. So the storehouse of God will open up and the thing will start to flood your life. So one of the ways through which you can activate these things and cause them to flow is through tithing and giving. Now, since the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, there is nothing that we need on the surface of the earth when we ask God that he will not give to us. Nothing. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and all that dwell therein, including the ones who don't know God, all belong to God. So the Bible says the heart of the king is like a stream of water and he turns it where he wills. He can turn somebody's heart to favor you. He can even make an enemy who doesn't want to let you go to let you go. He said, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. He forces them. He commands them. Makes them to be at peace with you. Are you hearing what I am saying? So, everything belongs to the Lord. The trees belong to the Lord. Everything here is. Everything. Everything here is. Everything is at the disposal of God. Some of you don't understand, but let me give you a little bit of hint, which you already know. When Elijah declared there will be no rain, who did God say will feed him? He said, go to the brooks. He said, I've commanded the ravens to bring you food every day to feed you. What are ravens? Birds. Elijah obeyed. And every day, these birds, all of them will pick grain and then come and drop it on one spot and it will become a heap. And the man will use it to make his food. Every day they will bring enough to last for the whole day. Every day until the brook dried up. So even ravens obey God. Didn't you hear Jesus? If you refuse to praise me, I will come. These stones, God is able to make the stones to praise God. So everything hears God. Everything obeys God. So the animals in the field can walk in your favor. The ants can walk in your favor. Everything can walk in your favor. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Even the devil can walk in your favor. Oh, you don't think so? They do. They can torment your enemies. And make them to leave you alone. Are they not walking in your favor in the process? Yes, they are. So please bear this in mind. John chapter 15 verse 7. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish. I need to be giving you. All that God asks of you is remain. Stay connected. Take my word. Store it in your heart.
word of truth. The gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal. The promised Holy Spirit. Who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. It's like you want to take a loan. They say deposit something. Bring your car. Okay, the car you may need it. Bring the papers. Let's have the papers so that in case you don't pay, these papers help us to reclaim your car. Or bring the uh, papers for your house or for your land. Something to deposit. To assure us that you are willing to pay the money. Because you will not like to lose the car, you will not like to lose the land, you will not like to lose the house. Is that not true? So you are assuring them, giving them assurance, double assurance. I am willing. So your word is not enough, but you are putting something physical down to convince the person that truly you mean business. And that's what God did. So God gave us the Holy Spirit as a deposit. Guaranteeing that all these things he promised us in Christ, they are real. That you have eternal place waiting for you in heaven. That you have a place in the city that he's constructed. That you are going to dwell with him forever. Is it clear? So what are we inheriting? Eternal home with God. Do you have the Holy Spirit? Oh yes you do. So what is that? A deposit. A guarantee. That heaven is your home. I'm real. Heaven is real. The city is real. The golden city is real. You have a place in me. You have right standing with me. That's why the Holy Spirit is there. Everything I've been saying to you, everything you read in the Bible is real. And you are going to enjoy it. That's why the Holy Spirit is in you. Not just for you to speak in tongues. Laba, 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 laba. No. No. Have you seen it now? Have you marked it in your Bible? Please mark that place. Go and read it again. Go and meditate upon it. Let it sink into your spirit. So that you don't play with your salvation. You don't play with your relationship with the Lord. Take him serious. This thing has nothing to do with pastor member. Everybody must run this race. I'm running my own race. Run your own. Husband is running his race. Wife is running her race. The one that runs well is the one who God will commend. You see? The two shall be lying together. One shall be taken. One shall be left behind. That means husband and wife. They know they do and co go heaven. I will keep saying it until it sinks into your spirit. It's not my husband is faithful. It's not my wife is faithful. It's not my mother is faithful. My daddy is faithful. No. You as a person. Whosoever believes shall be saved. It's a personal race. I can motivate you. I can encourage you. I can set you an example. I can challenge you. That's why we're together. We encourage one another. But I cannot live for you. I cannot believe for you. So believe these things. You can see the way I'm sharing with you. See, 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 God didn't make it to be complicated. It's a lot of package, a lot of a lot of promises. So I don't understand why people are, you know, you know, behaving as if God this thing is they are doing it for pastor. They are just going there to go and contribute money to pastor. I don't understand. Or maybe they are just going there to go and please pastor. You don't understand what God did. You don't understand what this thing is all about. If you understand it, nobody, no, you don't need anybody to motivate you. Even if you are sick and you almost died and nobody came, you will still come to church. This eternal home with God is something to look forward to, I tell you. The joy of dwelling forever in the presence of the Almighty God and Jesus who died for us. And the blessed Holy Spirit, our comforter, helper and strengthener have nothing to be compared with here on earth. Nothing. I will see his face when I get there. I will see his face, see his smiling face, and his hands open wide, saying, Welcome home, my son. I'm looking forward to him embracing me too, sir. Praise God. <laughs> now imagine that. No sickness. The home we're going to, no sickness. No weeping. No crying, no sorrow, no death, no evil of any kind. No demon spirits, no witches, no wizards, nobody to tempt you, no fighting. What a privilege to live in, in the glorious, most beautiful city of God. 
The city built by God himself with his own hands. As his own bride. The new Jerusalem is a place to look forward to. To walk on golden streets is something else. If I ask the ladies in the house how much they used to buy that small gold ring, gold uh, earring or necklace, even the one that is gold plated. And if you have GL, you'll be, ah, 24 carat, 22 carat, 18 carat, you'll be bragging. Tiny thing. But here, I am walking on what? On streets made with solid gold, not gold plated, solid gold. Then somebody will tell me that God is against gold. When the streets of heaven is made of gold. I mean, leave that in. <laughs> Praise God. So the gold that men spend huge sums of money to buy will become my carpet. Glory to Jesus. If you have not received Jesus, you better do. If you are here and you have not surrendered your life to Jesus, I tell you, you will miss. So give your heart to Jesus today. You come to church, you come to Bible study, you are, but you are here to decide for Jesus. Make that decision. Look, you can be in and out. One leg in, one leg out. Make up your mind, follow Jesus. So that you don't miss all these blessings. Don't miss all these blessings. Don't allow five minutes fun to make you lose this thing. Don't allow anybody to convince you to turn away from Christ. Don't allow any challenge or difficulty or temptation to make you to you know, abandon him. Stay faithful. It's a beautiful place. John chapter 14 verse 3. Hear what the master said. John 14 verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. So he's preparing a place. You know why he has not come? He's still preparing your home. I don't know whether it's a room. I don't know whether it's a mansion you have, but you have a place in that city. Somebody said, I must be there. <laughs> Somebody said, I'm already there. <laughs> Praise God. Now let's read quickly Revelation chapter 21. We're reading from verse 9 to 27. Let's see the vision that uh, John had and the description of the city. Now one of the seven angels, who, Revelation chapter 21 from verse 9, from verse 9 to 27. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down. Coming down from where? Out of heaven from God. He shone with the glory of God and his brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel. You know, sparkling, shining, glittering. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like a jasper, clear as crystal. Woo! It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. Now the angel who talked with me had a message. Come on, go back. Okay, 14. Okay, yeah, 14. Go back to 13, please. Take it easy, please. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. 14. The wall of the city had 12 foundations. On them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. 15. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. 16. The city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and high as it is long. He measured its walls and it was 144 cubits thick by man's measurement which the angel was using. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stones. The first foundation was Jasper, the second Sapphire, the third Chalcedony, the fourth Emerald, the fifth Sardonyx, the sixth Carnelian, the seventh Chrysolite, the eighth Beryl, the ninth Topaz, the tenth Chrysopris, the eleventh Jacinth, and the twelfth Amethyst. 
These are all precious stones. 21. The 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each gate made of a single pearl. The great city, the great street of the city was of pure gold. Pure. Like transparent glass. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need sun or the moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives it light and the Lamb is his lamp. The nations will walk by his light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut for there will be no night there. Continuous day. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Hallelujah. Nothing impure will ever enter it. Nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. What a beautiful city. I don't know if you understand what we're talking about here. It's, 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 it's something to look forward to. Something everyone should desire that nothing will make them miss it. Amen, somebody. Ooh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. It's beautiful. So that's going to be your home. Your next home where you depart this world. Amen? Are you looking forward to it? Don't let anything make you miss it. Now compare it with hellfire. Compare it with lake of fire. Can the beauty stand inside fire? Will you have chairs inside fire? Come on, somebody talk to me. Will you be able to will you have restaurants inside fire? Uh. May the Lord bless you. So, knowledge of this great inheritance serves as a comforter in the midst of hard times. Once you know this, it will comfort you. It will be encouraged that I'm not suffering for nothing. I am not going through persecution for nothing. When you think of if I bow to this problem, if I bow to these persecutors and deny Christ, I miss this. You will encourage yourself. You will endure it. That's what Paul was thinking about in Ephesians chapter 1, which we read earlier. We're not going to read it again. It is indeed a home to look forward to. Paul says that we must be ready to suffer with him in order to be glorified with him in this great inheritance. Romans 8, 17, which we read earlier. So fix your eyes on this glorious inheritance. If you do, you will be able to go through any trial or tribulation without denying your Lord. It has helped me in times of serious crisis. It will help you too. It helped Apostle Paul that is why he's teaching us to do the same with the passage we have just considered. Just know, understand what God has prepared for you. And God will strengthen you to face and win over every challenge. Now the fourth inheritance, the name and authority of Christ Jesus. That name is yours. Somebody says, mine. Jesus inherited the name that is above every name. That are the mention of which every knee in heaven on earth and beneath and the earth shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. That's what Philippians chapter 2 verse 9 to 11 tells us. Philippians 2 9 to 11. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Verse 10. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and beneath the earth. I'm not at the earth, sorry. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So since we are joined hands with Jesus Christ, we are now given authority to exercise the authority and the power that is inherent in the name of Jesus. So you and I have the mandate and the authority of God to use the name. And when you invoke that name, everything that is, in, that, that is under the authority of Christ 
will obey you. And the Bible says that he's higher than every name that can be named in this world and in the world to come. He's higher than every authority, every power, every dominion, every kingship, every rulership. Every authority is under his own authority. So who is greater than him? No one. And what is under him is under you. And all that is in his name, and he gave it to you. He gave it to me. He gave it to us, the church, to use. You know why this is important that we know this? Because you see, if you are using somebody's name and you don't know the power that it has, the authority that is accompanied to that name, you won't have the maximum benefit. You won't see the power produced. But when you know what that name can do and you truly understand it and you are fearless in using it, you will see great results. Look at Peter. Silver and gold we don't have, but such as we have, we give unto you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and so they know they have such as we have, which means they are aware that that authority is with them. They are aware that the name of Jesus can make the man rise. The authority in that name can quicken his bones, adjust them. You know a crippled person that the thing has become stiff. Do not get straight. Not become stiff. Become stiff. Then he said, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. So he's expecting that name to do what? Blah, blah. The power of God will enter and straighten the legs. So if person can stand, because as long as the legs are cut, he can stand. Then all these stiff nerves, all of them, the veins, everything we just straighten up, the muscles begin to come alive. Because if you have ever touched a lame person, you will see the thing is very lean, like just like skin and bone. But then strength has to come, the muscles have to begin to shoot out and become functional so the person can walk. So first he was leaping and then he was, you know, jumping and then he was walking, then he was running. This changed and commotion came. And a great crowd gathered. That day, the church, the Bible said the number came to 5,000. What a miracle. You know how it will look like if that kind of a thing happened here? Is it going to be a small, small shouting? Small shouting and praising the Lord and jumping. And people in the street will gather. Hey, what is that? A crippled man, they walk for his church. Think about it. Think of the name. Think of the power. So that when next the enemy comes against you and you want to use that name and invoke that authority, you will have no single fear or doubt in your mind that it will work. Jesus said, if you, if you say to this mountain, be thou removed, be cast into the sea. He says, shall come to pass if you don't doubt. So what will eliminate doubt? What will make you not to doubt? It is this insight that we are sharing. When you take your time to meditate on the fact that there is authority in that name to change any situation, that the authority of Jesus is embedded in his name. So anything you are declaring in his name, be, be rest assured that God is going to honor you. But of course, it must be according to God's will. Because the Bible says, you know, when you ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So whatever it is you are decreeing cannot be contrary to the will of God, but in agreement with him. And so it will work. You know, that's why sometimes we kill, 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 kill. Nobody's dying. Because it is not the plan of God to kill the person. But if it is the plan of God to kill the person, even before you finish saying it, the person will drop dead. How many of you understand what I'm saying? Eh? If it is the plan of God, that God say this person's cup is full, make that decree. Once you make the decree, it will happen. But if God didn't say, and it is not the plan of God, and you are decreeing it, it will not come to pass. I hope someone is getting what I'm saying. So that's why you need to be in the spirit always. So that you don't waste your time decreeing and declaring what God is not in agreement with. So it will not look as if there is no power and authority in the name or in your life. You have authority on your life. You have power in your life. And that power of Christ is in his name and is for us. So we have inherited it. So we will use it wisely. We will use it to drive away the devil from our lives. You say, in my name, there's a cast out devils. 
We use it so, to neutralize poison. So even if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. You st st walk, st uh, step on it, it will not harm you. You sit on it, it will not harm you. You use it to bath, it will not harm you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You are safe in the name. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it, they are safe. The authority is there. Your defense is in the name. Your, your victory is in the name. The power to chase the devil away is in the name. The power to cure illnesses and set people free from bondage is in the name. He said, my name, they shall lay hands on the sick. They shall recover. So with the name, we decree on matters and they are established. The sick is healed, the oppressed set free. All with the name of Jesus. So as joined heads with Jesus Christ, let us use the full authority and power the name of Jesus gives us to make our lives and world a better place. No one will do it for you. So instead of you saying, oh God, come and cast out this devil, tell the devil, get out in Jesus' name. What did he say? In my name, they shall cast out devils. He didn't say, they shall call me to cast out the devil and I will cast out the devil. It is you who will command the devil to go. And Jesus only is to do what you say. So whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. So you don't ask, nothing gets done. You don't decree, nothing gets established. Oh, you are crying about a situation. He said, you tell the situation to move. And it shall come to pass if you don't. Now. So after you have argued your case with God, now speak to the situation. What do you want? What is it you want? You want something to stop? Command it to stop. You want something new to happen? Command that new thing to happen. Believe. Don't doubt. The church has the authority. Conclusion. Treasure your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and believe everything he says is yours. In him. Everything he says is yours in him. Believe it. Everything he says is yours in him. Believe it. He says you are his son. Believe it. He says everything is under your feet. Believe it. He says you cannot be harmed by the devil. Believe it. You shall tread upon serpents and scorpions and over the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Believe it. Stop panicking. Stop being afraid. Even if they write you a letter, they are coming to your house. Don't run away from your house. Stop being afraid. You dream that something evil happened. Don't be afraid. Rebuke it. Cancel it. And continue your life. Believe whatever it says. Live in the consciousness of who you are in Christ. Live in the consciousness of who you are and what is yours in Christ Jesus. Whatever God says he has given you, believe it. Be conscious of it that you have it. Peter said, such as we have. Be conscious of it. You have it. You have it. You have it. It's with you. He says you are his son. He says you are his ambassador. He says you are his representative. He says you can't be hurt by the devil. Believe it. Be conscious of it as you travel. Be conscious of it as you are in your house. Be conscious of it. Even when you see all the evils happening around, they are kidnapping people, they are doing this. Don't be scared. Believe. It's not your portion. It's not your portion. That's why we're doing these studies. So that your faith will be strong in what Christ has done. So that fear will disappear. So that whatever kind of challenge that comes your way, you know that you know you will come out of it triumphant. Amen, somebody. Amen. I know the human factor is always there, but don't let, it, don't let that take you over. Focus on the life that comes from heaven. Focus on this relationship you have with Jesus. Focus on the new creation. The more you focus on the new creation, the more victorious your life becomes. The more you focus on the human nature, the more you live like a normal human being, and the more the devil will have upon hand over you. You are not a normal human being. You are a supernatural being. You are a son of God. You come from above. Are you hearing me? And he who is from above is above all. Stand to your feet. Let's pray. Say, Father, I thank you. I'm a new creation. I thank you that I'm your son. I thank you that you're my father. I thank you that I am in you and you are in me. I thank you that we are one. I thank you that everything you have said concerning me will be a reality in my life. Open your mouth and pray that prayer. Just give him thanks and make these declarations alongside. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I'm grateful that I know you. You are my Savior. You are my Lord. I'm thankful. Laribada, Sebro Seta, Eparata, Shadatali Deheze. 
Thank you. You are my father. You are my God. You are my support. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Yeah. You are faith. You are glorious. You are powerful. There is no one like you, Lord. No one like you. No one like you. No one like you. Thank you that I am. I am. I am you. You are me. You are inside me. We are one. Thank you. We are one. We are one. We are one. I in you, you in me. As the Father, as Jesus is on earth, so am I in this world. The Bible says, I give you praise. As you are, Lord, so am I in this world. As you are, so am I in this world. As you are, Lord Jesus, so am I in this world. Thank you. Thank you. If the devil couldn't defeat you, the devil can't defeat me. If the devil couldn't take you captive, he cannot take me captive. If the devil couldn't, couldn't harm you, he cannot harm me. What cannot happen to you cannot happen to me. I share your life with you. Thank you because your authority is mine. The power you have given unto me through your name. And I thank you. When I invoke that name, the fullness of your authority will come into manifestation. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that when we tread upon serpents and scorpions and over the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt us. Glory to you, Father. Can you thank him that you are a heir of God? Say, Lord, I thank you that I am a heir of God. I thank you that I have access to your presence 24 hours of the day. I thank you that I have eternal dwelling with you. I thank you, Lord, that your name and authority is mine to use here on earth. Thank you. Thank you for these fourfold blessings of yours. We are grateful. We are grateful. We are grateful. We are not normal human beings. We are supernatural beings. We are sons of God here on earth. We reign in life. We are on top of situations. We give you praise. We give you glory. We magnify your name, O oh Lord. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Father, we thank you for your word. We bless you because I believe it has entered into your people and you will keep it there. No one will forget it. Help us to live in the consciousness of these truths always. Every one of us will walk in victory every day. Thank you, Father. Everyone who has been experiencing some shakings from the devil, I set them free in Jesus' name. Any demonic spirit that has been manipulating your mind, manipulating your fear, your faith, manipulating your mind and making you to be unsettled in one way or the other, I rebuke them and I cast them out of your life in Jesus' name. 